thanks, thanks, Andy. I, I thought all this while uh, this afternoon, when 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 I was preparing my notes for for this session, what is my first sentence going to be? It's when you when you are I'm a biased reviewer, a biased discussant of this of this book, and and so if I said this book is very interesting, read it, or this book is seminal and very important, you wouldn't believe me anyways, and, and, and we invited Matt over here probably not to, to tell an audience of, of, of 80 plus people that this is a terrible book, please don't pay any attention to it. Um, what instead my first sentence is going to be that uh, when, when I take this back home, it's, it sits on my bookshelf uh, on, the, on the same shelf with uh, Aaron Voldowski, Alan Schick, Naomi Caden, uh, Christopher Hood, uh, uh, and, and, and other people of that tradition. And, and that means two things. On the one hand, if you, if you know which books, I like, which books I like to read and which authors I like to cite, then that's probably as high as I can go on the scale of making compliments without blushing. Uh, but it also, <laughs> I think, it's, a, it's an important point of departure when you, when you read this, that it's Matt just spoke a lot about development and what this means for development practice. I think it's, it's a, as, a, as a piece of analysis, it straddles two different disciplines. One is international development, the other is public administration. But to me, it's really a public administration book that looks at international development. That probably says as much about my own biases than, than, than anything else, but just take that for what it is. Um, and I think this, this combination is actually quite important. So you have um, a, a part one of the book, which is mostly positive in, in the positive normative sense, that it just looks at a phenomenon and, and a problematic phenomenon, finds a language to describe it, and then, and then moves on to the second part of the book, which is much more normative, uh, not in the moral sense of the word, but just in the as opposed to positive sense of the word that it, it comes up with things that people should do in order to make things better. And, and that's sort of an <coughs> agenda, I think, for people who are in the public administration community would actually find fairly uncomfortable because if you're an academic and you study public administration, normally you would say, this is how it is, let someone else deal with it. Whereas if you, if you are a development practitioner, you would say, I already know what the solution is. Let somebody else give me the analysis that proves the point that I knew <laughs> before, before I started to commission people to do any actual work. So to be able to do all of this in, in, in the scope and scale of one book and kind of sort of pull it off so that you make your way to chapter six and then you make your way through to chapter nine and think this is actually really good. Uh, that's, that's not a small accomplishment, I think. Um, I want to talk just for one second about this idea of PDIA as uh, that really is the, the crucial component of the second part of the book, the way I understand it. And as Matt said quite correctly, uh, it's a terrible acronym. I have to <laughs> say it very, very slowly, problem-driven iterative adaptation, because otherwise I would twist my tongue even trying to pronounce it. What that means to me is that there must be something meaningful about each of those letters. Otherwise, you would have come up with something far snazzier. And um, I think as development practitioners, it's easy for us to sort of say, oh, this is about problems, I understand. Then we are going to be OK, because we understand problems. We analyze everything that we do. We go to places, we find the problems, and then we tell governments how to fix those problems. So PDIA is a reinforcement of what we've been doing all along. And I think that would be a gross misinterpretation of what's really important about the I and the A. To me, I don't find the problem part hugely innovative on its own. What I find important is the iterat iterative adaptation because you can't iteratively adapt someone else. It's an active thing that you do if you are a government or a state. You are the one who does the adapting. You, you, you can't outsource that process. And if you want to be a problem-driven iterative adapter, it has a lot of consequences for the role of external actors yeah. in that particular mechanism of institutional change, the way it's conceived here. And I think those, those are some of the Im 
in uh, uh, implications that as development practitioners we probably would do well to take very seriously because some of that is going to be quite uncomfortable in terms of its implications for the way development practitioners do their work. Um, I, I also find it very important that if you leave this issue of development and aid and external assistance aside for a second, there is really no reason to think that Sweden, South Africa, Rwanda, uh, Somalia are, are any different in the way these mechanisms of institutional change work. At least that to me seems to be the, the preposition of this analysis, especially the second, the second part of it. And again, I think that that's actually quite quite a profound statement to make and something that many people would disagree with on some level, but this is really how the argument, how the argument works. Now, I think there are two particular things that, that I took away from this public administration view onto development that, that, that made me think. The first one is about the relationship between development and aid. If, if, if I understand Matt correctly, then for, for, for him, institutional capability is really the crucial ingredient for development, and I would agree with that. But if you take that seriously, then the role of aid in facilitating development as institutional change is incredibly limited, because, because it's something that someone else has to do. The only reason why large, amount of a large amounts of aid would really be relevant in the scheme of things is because institutional change itself is really expensive. If institutional change isn't really expensive and there isn't a lot to pay for, then the entire dynamic ab of development becomes about something else. Um, again, that's a point that you can consider and you can probably, many would disagree with it, but that to me is an important implication of this. And the second point is that uh, as development practitioners, we are, to the extent that we are we, um, are just horribly behind the curve of public administration research um, because there's a lot of Lindblom, uh, Wildavsky, Paul and DiMaggio in this work. All of that has been around since the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s. There would have been plenty of time for somebody else to beat Matt to this particular book and just try to draw those particular conclusions. And if you, if you had only read, for instance, the, the Science of Muddling Through, which is about 15 pages long from 1959, yeah. if you had read Aaron Wildovsky's work on implementation and why nothing that is designed in Washington ever gets implemented the same way it is meant to be, then you, you would never expect something like a poverty reduction strategy paper to, to work as designed. You would never expect any large international institutional re-engineering project to work anywhere close to the way it's designed. And all of these repetitive failures of institutional reform that Matt talks about in the book shouldn't have come as, as much of a surprise to, to people familiar with that kind of literature. And yet we are, we are now looking at this and, 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 and treating it as something that is kind of a novelty. <coughs> and that is probably as much an indication of uh, uh, our ability to look left and right and, and, and read widely than it is about anything else, which uh, happily now we don't have to do that anymore because it's, it's all in here. Um, the, the, the really, really positive thing that I think you can take away from this, on the other hand, is that the, the examples that Matt refers to here um, are not the typical the Swedens, the, the, the South Koreas. It's, it's, it's about places like Indonesia like Rwanda, which public administration at, at West European universities, for instance, where we really only look at maybe two dozen countries that are of relevance, or universities in the US, which really only looks at one country <laughs> that, is, that is of relevance and, and sort of <laughs> worthy of serious <laughs> academic study. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff in here that, that is, is very interesting and innovative uh, as, as sort of object of study and objects of inquiry for public administration research, mm -hmm. which I think is also quite valuable and quite important. Um, there are a couple of limitations that I would just like to mention before we move on to pair. The first one is that um, the book itself is not a theory of everything. 
it's, it's, it's actually a fairly narrow argument about institutional change and how that works through an identification of problems and, and things that happen afterwards. It doesn't tell us a whole lot about where those problems come from in the first place. Sure, you can say that every problem ultimately is socially constructed, otherwise it's, it's a thing like the weather and it doesn't really matter, it only becomes a problem when someone in, in power decides that this is a problem that's worth fixing. Yeah. But in the book itself, there's a lot of agnosticism about what's sort of worthy being treated as a problem. And there's not much at all about some of the reasons why some countries are better at dealing with these sorts of entrenched problems of development than other countries. Literally, the, the answer of the book would be, well, they don't do PDIA, and therefore they are not moving forward through institutional change. But why they are not doing it, why it, elites are so entrenched, why some governments are just incredibly malicious and others are not, you would have to find that somewhere else. Again, it's not a theory of everything, but you just need to be aware of these limitations. And, th and the final point that I would like to make, and that I think is maybe slightly more controversial, is that the book and, and the implicit model of the state that, that is sort of underlying this is very good governance neutral, and it's very democracy neutral. It, and that's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. That's, that's how it's meant to be read, I think. And yeah. it, it, has an, it's had, it has an image of, of states where government officials deal with stuff because they need to adapt and they need to sort of survive as an entity. And through change processes that sometimes are very long and long-winded and complicated, many of those countries where you have capable states because they are able to enforce a monopoly in violence, they because they are able to enforce some semblance of the rule of law, that also happens to be beneficial for individual welfare. But there, there are lots of states that would be perfectly nice uh, problem-driven iterative adapters that are not nice countries and that are not nice governments that are normatively probably deplorable in some of the other things that just fall outside of this novel, uh, this model. And so again, when you look at this and when you look at um, the, the, the understanding of development <coughs> that is proposed here, you, n you need to be able to put that into, into a larger context in, in order to be able to evaluate how, how you would rate certain countries a yeah. along a scale of development. And some of that might be sort of institutional, operational, functional. Normative questions are an entirely moral questions are an entirely different matter, but they obviously uh, come into play here. And I'm going to leave it at that and uh, hand the, the microphone back to Andy. Thanks, Philip. That was great and very stimulating. Interesting questions there, I think, also about whether there are ethics and norms of public service that in some way implicitly underpin what you describe, so whether it is a bit less morally neutral, normatively neutral, than Philip made out. Um, but now I'd love to find out whether Pear feels that Matt's attempt to retrofit <laughs> his theory onto your experience in Sweden in the early 1990s makes sense to you. 